So I guess I'll start. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the discussion, Anthropological Insights into Deterring War and Promoting Peace. Uh, my name is Kristina Yonatita. I will be um, moderating today's event together with Victor Damank, who is um, here today as well, and we're both based at Vilnius University. Uh, the event today is 11th uh, event in the series Conversations in Anthropology, which is co-organized by the Institute of Asian and Transcultural Studies at Vilnius University and the Society for Anthropological Sciences Euro-Asia. And uh, today's event, is the, as well as the one last week, is or also organized with, in partnership with the Lithuanian Anthropological Association. Um, and really the main organizer in all of this is, is Victor de Monk. Um, um, and he will take over in the in the discussion part and question and answer part. Uh, so I'll just start with a couple of details about the event, the order of today. Um, as you already, I think, got notifications, today's event is being live streamed on Facebook on um, Institute of Asian and Transcultural Studies Facebook page. Um, and this recording will also remain there as well as on YouTube. Um, and today we have four participants. Uh, you probably saw three in the advertising information in the in the poster. Um, Dr. Douglas Fry, Dr. David Hennig, and Dr. Glenn Peterson. Um, but also today we're joined uh, kind of last minute uh, uh, by Dr. Gintotas Majekas, who has kindly agreed to also um, give a talk. Uh, so today's event is directly related to a discussion that happened last week at the same time, which was entitled Anthropological Insights into the Causes and Consequences of War. Um, so we had uh, three of today's participants, as well as da uh, Dr. Catherine Lutz, who shared the research on war in different ethnographic contexts and in different regions. Um, Unfortunately, she wasn't able to join us uh, this week, but um, you can find the link uh, uh, to the video of the um, discussion on Facebook, and I will also put it in the chat in a minute. Uh, so the way that we will run the discussion today is each speaker will um, give up an individual presentation of 15 to 20 minutes, and then we will have a um, discussion, a closed discussion amongst the speakers with any additional questions or comments they might have. Um, and then we will open the floor to uh, the audience to ask questions as well. So if you have any questions, you can save them until the Q&A part uh, towards the end and just raise your indicate, uh, raise your hand. Uh, but you can also write them in the chat section throughout today, and then we will put, pick up the, the questions um, later. So the focus today will be on anthropological perspectives on the war in Ukraine and the ethnography of peace systems. Um, in short, our, our speakers will discuss what anthropology can contribute to understanding how to avoid war and participate in uh, constituting transcultural, sociocultural uh, systems that promote peace within a democratic context. Um, so I guess we will aim for a discussion of up to two hours, between an hour and a half and two hours. Um, and I guess we can start unless I'm missing any information. Um, so the first speaker today, is Professor Douglas Fry, uh, who is also the chair of the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Um, he has written extensively on aggression, conflict resolution, and war and peace. Amongst his recent work is a, a 2019 monograph co-authored with uh, Rian Eisler titled Nurturing Our Humanity. He is currently researching how clusters of neighboring societies manage to live without war, constructing enduring peace systems among themselves. Um, and he has worked on this together with his co-author Genevieve Sulak, who is also with us um, today in the event. So the title of his talk today is Peace Systems, How to Replace War with Sustainable Peace. Um, so over to uh, to Douglas then. Um.
Um, uh, Douglas, are you there? Uh, Douglas, can you share your PowerPoint with us? Uh, we can't hear you yet. Doug, can you hear us? Something's going on, but uh, I don't know what. Uh, so Douglas, uh, we, we can't hear you and we don't see your PowerPoint. So we are ready to go if you are. Oh my God. Um, I, I apologize if I've been messing something up. Somehow my speaker got turned off. So. Oh, I can, can you hear us uh, now? Or? Yeah, yes, I can. When I got your message to unmute, I realized something might be a little bit awry. Okay, well, um, we I have introduced you, and so we are ready for your um, talk, if you are. Okay, I, I certainly am, and again, I apologize for this confusion. I didn't get to hear the introduction, but I'm sure it was fabulous. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'll just plunge in. Let me share screen here. It's great to be here today. Um, that was a, a Zoom mess up, which I did not anticipate. Uh, I have no idea how that got muted on another control panel. Okay. <clears throat> Do I get a heads up that you're seeing the first slide of the presentation? Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, so this is a uh, jointly authored paper with uh, Genevieve Suyak. I'll be presenting it and Genevieve is here in, in case we get into a discussion later about things. So I'm gonna talk to you a bit about non-warring peace systems today. Some neighboring societies do exist as peace systems, meaning that they do not make war on each other. And then sometimes they don't make war at all, but the key element here is there are clusters of neighboring societies that don't make war with each other. So the first question this raises is, can a study of peace systems provide insights for peace building in other contexts or more generally? And then the big question in gold, which I think is a very important one at this point in the, in the human experiment, could humanity create a global peace system wherein war is no longer waged on planet Earth? So I just want to raise that big question. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today stemmed from a science article back in 2012, where I proposed six at that time, um, ways that peace systems may keep the peace as hypotheses. And what has happened subsequently, as, as I've worked with my colleagues, is that we split apart six and seven. That's why it says split. And we've added a new variable, visionary peace leadership. And I'll give you some results uh, shortly about these. But just to give you an idea of the types of variables that we hypothesized that might be important to maintain a functioning peace system. And there are many different examples of peace systems across different levels of social organization. So to an anthropological audience, this may make sense that we're looking for general patterns and principles and features, we could say, that promote peace across different types of social situations. And these are just some of the, the cases of peace systems that we've located in the anthropological and historical literature. And the two at the bottom, the Brazilian Upper Xingu River Basin tribes and the European Union um, will deserve a little extra attention today. So I'll talk a bit about both of those examples. And then I'll show you some of our most recent results in terms of those variables that I put forth as hypotheses. And if we have a little time at the end, uh, I'll also um, show you a few minutes of a recent film that we've made on peace systems. 
So the first thing to notice about the upper Jingu tribes is they're well studied. Uh, this is not always the case in anthropology, of course, but we have an, uh, a cadre of anthropologists coming in uh, over decades and doing work with these Jingu tribes. It even goes back to before anthropology arrived to the explorer Carl Vandensteiner, who recorded the peaceful system of the upper Jingu back in the 1880s. And then this was followed up by anthropologist Buell Quain doing field work among the Tremai, one of the groups, and noted a lack of war among the upper Jingu tribes also at this time period. And then we fast forward to the 80s and 90s when Tom Greger um, studied the Mayan, the Mayan Aku, but also did interviews with all of the different upper Jingu tribes. And he writes, during the 100 years over which we have records, there is no evidence of war among the Jingu groups. And he wrote that notice in 1990, so we add another 32 years to um, this peace system. Here's sort of a combination of Tom Greger's thinking and mine. Um, certain variables start to emerge. Uh, interdependence, for instance, in terms of trade, marriage ceremonies, values and belief, which are anti-war, uh, and then conflict management, most notably dealing with things non-violently through harangues uh, or wrestling matches. So thinking a little bit about interdependence, um, ceremonies reinforce for the participants that they belong to a larger peaceful social system. And in the words of Wen Jingwana, we don't make war. We have festivals for the chiefs to which all the villages come. We sing, dance, trade, and wrestle. So that's a, um, an expanded identity. They expand the us, I like to say sometimes, playing on the us versus them. They expand the us beyond the tribe. They belong not solely to their tribe, but also to a larger interdependent social system linked by things like trade, marriage, intermarriage, um, and ceremonies. The Xinguanos also hold a and nurture anti-war values. For instance, for them, peace is moral behavior, whereas war is immoral. Just think about that for a minute, war is immoral. Violence is a pathetic mark of failed leadership would be another example of the value system. So harangues, one mechanism through which the people of the upper Jingu air their grievances nonviolently is, is through these harangues. And another way is um, through competitive wrestling, which occurs within the village and also among people from different villages. One of the informants told Gregor and, and Robachek, it's actually Gregor's fieldwork, when our bellies are hot with anger, we wrestle and the anger is gone. So to sum this up about the upper Jingu, um, the peace system is reinforced in an ongoing fashion, I would argue, through intervillage trade, intermarriage that interlinks groups, joint ceremonies. These are social institutions that promote an interdependence among the tribal groups. And in terms of beliefs, they expand the us identity to include the whole peaceable social system. So they don't just have one parochial identity at the tribal level, but they have a, a different identity at a higher level. And then as mentioned, the anti-war and anti-violent values play a role in keeping the peace. War is considered immoral, it is uncivilized, it's unfitting um, of, of people to engage in. So the second case, uh, real quickly, and I apologize to European Union folks who think I'm giving short shrift to this wonderful example. There's so much to say. So this is just a quick overview to sort of illustrate um, how this idea of peace systems can be applied across different types of social organization. And one first point about the EU is that it removes this critique, which I, I know any anthropologist in the room has received it. Oh, well, that's great for that little culture, but you know, what about the real people? Um, so, so it's, they're not just ethnographic curiosities, in other words, if we consider the EU, and that sort of eliminates that argument from the get-go. Another point is that the EU has a clear written history, including the goals and the actual steps that were taken to increase um, integration, or in the words of the Treaty of Rome, to devise an ever closer union. There were key individuals who were involved, which was part of the reason we added a, an eighth hypothetical or hypothesized feature of peace systems, and that of peace leadership. Jean Monnet, Robert Schumann, um, Conrad Adenauer, for instance, had just lived through the horrors of World War II. And they, they avidly took on doing something new and doing something bold as an alternative to war. Peace building really was the explicit goal of European integration, which ultimately has led to the EU. 
quotation here from Maine, a mere five years after World War II had ended, Monet was proposing that former enemies join forces, that France and Germany placed the whole of Franco-German coal and steel production under a common high authority, open to the participation of other countries of Europe. That was just a landmark idea, see, because it went beyond national sovereignty. So one lesson is what was to become the EU began with a series of baby steps, moving in stages towards an overall goal of European integration. Peace building was the major goal. I just want to emphasize that. And Monet in his, in his memoirs talks about the importance of little steps. When one looks back here at the horrors of World War II, one sees the extraordinary disaster that Europeans have brought upon themselves. And of course, with what's happening in Ukraine, I, I think this is part of the shock that people didn't, didn't really believe that war could again break out in Europe and so quickly and so unexpectedly. Monet saw the necessity of replacing raw power with the power of the law. So the primary approach that was taken to make Europe economically integrated and then systematically make its member countries more and more economically interdependent. And this was an explicit strategy. The, the founders of the EU envisioned a spillover effect then where the economic interdependence would in turn lead to integration in other social realms. And this is indeed what has happened over the last half century. And of course, this process is continuing as, as we speak. Just to focus in a little bit on conflict resolution, it's interesting that um, part of the EU has a court of justice of the European communities. And it's been set up in a very equal way with 27 judges that serve renewable six-year terms, uh, judges representing each of the member states. The court does not merely offer opinions, it, it's a true court. It rather passes judgments that the national courts are bound by treaty to enforce. It's an alternative form of conflict resolution uh, instead of war. But of course, that's not the only thing that's going on. Um, back to hypothesis number one about peace systems, there has been and continues to be a growing European identity in addition to uh, national identities. So of course, there's various symbols as anthropologists can point to that signify the European identity from um, flags to common currency, et cetera. I like this quote because it pretty much comes to the, uh, the essence of the change of attitude. Peace is therefore the primary achievement of the process of European integration from a Dutch parliamentarian, Euro parliamentarian. <clears throat> a shift in values has been important in developing the EU peace system. War is no longer considered an option within the EU system. This is a huge change in orientation from the times when World War II ravaged Europe. It's a huge change, right? After centuries of, of wars in Europe. Predominant values within the EU today emphasize human rights, tolerance, peace, cooperation, and solidarity. And in fact, on the EU website, there's an attention to values that are emphasized by the EU. The trend, however, is not, to, the, the trend, however, is to play down nationalism and national identity, not to eliminate it. It's an example of peace promotion by expanding the US to encompass also a larger social identity. So the research that we're currently engaged in, and, and which we published an article about a year ago in one of the Nature journals, um, involves comparing peace systems with a comparative group of, of neighboring societies uh, to see if we could isolate which of these key variables I showed you earlier might have the most important, or at least have an important uh, contributor to peace. So again, peace systems we're defining here rather specifically as negative, sorry, in a negative peace definition, as clusters of neighboring societies that do not make war on each other, and possibly not at all. And the key question is, what are the elements of positive sustainable peace operating in peace systems? Um, so you're just operationally thinking that it, a peace system must have existed for at least 75 years, which allows us to catch the EU. Uh, many of them have lasted much longer. We're focusing on about 16 uh, ethnographic examples of peace systems. In, in our work and comparing them with other societies. And again, to look at this in terms of a schematic or a diagram, um, how can you move a war allowing or a war based or even a war prone system of interrelations among neighbors to a peace system where they are clusters of neighbors that don't engage in war anymore? And here are the hypothesized variables once again. The idea is how do you shift from, shift from left to right 
If we look at 12 o'clock, we had war values and norms. How do we shift that, for instance, 12 o'clock on the right, peace values and norms? Or take three o'clock, weak or absent ties, how do we shift this to the right side of the diagram in a peace system of intergroup ties and so forth? <clears throat> Let me sh shift for a minute to a table and show you some uh, findings. All right, hopefully you're seeing the table here. This is from um, 2021 publication. Um, so what we have is, is the 16 peace systems compared to 30 non-peace systems, relatively small sample of size. Gathering this data is rather intensive. Here's some of the variables you'll recognize, overarching identity, interconnectedness, interdependence, non-warring values and norms, Non-warring myths, rituals, and symbols that would be supportive of non-value, non-warring values and norms. Um, superordinate institutions, such as that high authority that Monet and his colleagues set up for the European Union. Conflict management, that's uh, alternatives to war, generally speaking, non-violent conflict management. And then peace leadership was this variable we added in more recently. Also on the table are some war-related variables, which basically show a flip-flop relationship but if you wanna get the idea here, flip-flop relationship to peace systems, the idea is that it's a, a scale that is sort of like this. One is none, two is weak, three is moderate, four is strong. So the larger the number, the more prevalent the, the feature is. And if you look at peace systems, you're seeing in the neighborhood of, of threes or moderately strong compared to non-peace systems where it's, it's lower. And for most of these, six out of eight, there's a statistically significant difference between the peace systems and the non-peace systems. When I just said it flips in a minute, well, as you might expect, ethnocentrism doesn't seem to work so well for our, our data, but non, excuse me, warring, warring norms and values are actually then less in peace systems and greater in non-peace systems. That's sort of the, the core of our findings. But running a, a fancy statistical analysis, um, we actually discovered that the non-warring norms was the most important variable out of this whole list, which I think is, is pretty cool. So in terms of, um, back to, back to this. Okay, are you seeing the PowerPoint again, I hope? Shout if you're not, I'll assume we are. Yes. So a few close, yes? A few closing thoughts then. Um, there may actually be a relatively small number of variables that could be shifted to transform a from a war system into a peace system. I think that's an encouraging possible conclusion. And another element of the research, which I don't really have time to go into right now, but uh, global warming climate change might be a tipping point variable, for instance. In other words, we could call it ecological interdependence as a form of interdependence for shifting to a more positive reciprocity or a cooperating model, which includes a, a peace system on a, global, on a global scale. So in other words, we found, I'll just say this uh, off the slide, we found that sometimes, not always, peace systems had a generating feature of the members of the system that was to form feeling external threat. And one type of external threat was ecological. Another one was military. Uh, and sometimes it's not really a threat, but ecological or economic considerations seem to be a, a pushing point, if you will. So what I'm saying here is that perhaps at the global level, global warming climate change could be a, a tipping point which could encourage um, nations around the world to um, join into a peace system and work cooperatively together. So Kenneth Boulding once quipped, anything that exists is possible. And I always think that's good to remember. We actually have 
examples of non-warring peace systems. So they do exist. So they, they demonstrate to us that living without war is possible. The study of existing peace systems offers insights about peace building strategies and practices, which may have important applications in today's world. One lesson we can glean from this is thinking about Monet and his emphasis on the importance of having vision. I, I'm struck repeatedly by, unfortunately, the, the lack of vision that people uh, reflect in their writings and their speech and so forth, and their scenarios. Um, so I, I just wanted to emphasize this in my last slide. So to bring about change for the better, we must begin with a vision of a new reality, which we wish to or need to create. Let me ask you all, I could show one minute, three minutes, five minutes, and probably not more than that, if I have time at all to show you a little bit of the, the film. So please give me that feedback if we should take just a, a minute or two. I'm not sure if I'm over my time or on my time. I think we can do a couple of minutes, yeah. Okay, great. So let me address the next challenge of another screen share here. Um, bear with me just a moment. Zoom is great when it works, right? And as always, I'll check, are you seeing YouTube on the screen now? Hopefully. Yes, we are. Great, thank you folks. Okay. Ways possible through war. War is costly, wasteful, and inhumane. It stands in the way of cooperating to solve the threats to human survival. As pandemics threaten, the ice caps melt and nature weeps. Humanity must adopt new approaches to safety and security. Fighting amongst ourselves will not save us. Many people think there has always been war and there always will be war. But scientific evidence shows that some societies, past and present, have successfully shunned war by creating peace systems. Peace systems are clusters of neighboring societies that do not make war on each other. There are various historic and cross-cultural examples of peace systems, from tribal peoples to nations, and even to regions. The study of peace systems provides novel insights for ending wars and could help usher in an era of unsurpassed global cooperation. Peace systems share several characteristics. One key feature is the development of an overarching social identity, an inclusive identity that expands the us to include the them. Most citizens of the European Union, which was created to prevent wars, now hold an overarching identity as Europeans in addition to local and national identities. The historically warring Swiss cantons, some Protestant, some Catholic, some small, some large, came to perceive themselves as non-warring members of one larger and diverse social entity, the country of Switzerland. War among cantons is nowadays considered a thing of the past, long ago replaced by a multi-ethnic, multilingual society, where a diverse citizenry live peaceably together. I may be a native speaker of French, but my parents originally came from German-speaking Switzerland, and I myself worked in an Italian-speaking area. I live in a neighborhood in which over a hundred different nationalities live together in peace and harmony.
Okay, well, we'll end it there due to lack of time, but it's on YouTube as you see. Just Google a path away from war if you'd like to watch the whole video. It's about nine minutes long. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Douglas, for your interesting talk. I think it was, and the video as well, it was really interesting, I think, for us in, in Europe to, to hear about the EU as one of the peace systems. I think there will be uh, questions about it maybe later in the discussion as well. Um, so if we move to the second speaker, um, uh, Dr. David Hennig, I guess, would go next alphabetically, but he is running late. I, do, I don't see him amongst participants yet. Uh, so we will move over to uh, Glenn Peterson. Uh, Glenn, are you there? I'm just looking. Yes, for... I'm here. Yes, great. So uh, Professor Glenn Peterson is, is um, at Baruch College, which is part of uh, the City University in New York uh, system. He has written five ethnographies on Micronesia, on um, international affairs, political economy, and political anthropology. Amongst his recent work is the book titled War and the Arc of Human Experience on the Vietnam War. Um, and the book is written from dual perspectives of an insider and a researcher of the war. And as we learned um, last week, it was after uh, taking part in the Vietnam War that Professor uh, Peterson decided to even become an anthropologist. Um, so the title of his talk today is on not knowing just how terrified one actually is. So Glenn, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I am indeed mining uh, my book, uh, War and the Arc of Human Experience. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an ethnographer. Uh, I spent uh, much of my career uh, living in uh, small villages and small islands in the Pacific, but also working beside the Micronesians uh, who were, when I started there, an American colony, working with them to end American trusteeship. Uh, and ultimately, ultimately prevailed, uh, and, th and then they sent me to represent them at the United Nations. So I have a number of different perspectives on all of this. Um, one of the most uh, interesting aspects of, of, of my ethnographic work is having worked with constitutional conventions out there in the islands. Uh, I'm very conscious of the pride with which uh, Micronesia's leaders uh, speak of the fact that they actually uh, achieved independence. And, and believe me, the United States did not want to grant them independence. They achieved independence without resorting to violence. Uh, and they thought that that was really a, a, a remarkable achievement. Um, I did uh, for a time some comparative research in Puerto Rico, I wanted to look at another case of a, a, an American colonial rule and, and how the Puerto Ricans were dealing with that. And as I prepared to go there, uh, a colleague of mine who was a political scientist uh, said to me that she, that she could arrange uh, some meetings with some important Puerto Rican leaders if I'd like. And then she looked at me and she said, oh, wait a second, you're an anthropologist, you don't talk to the leaders. And I felt like she understood that uh, I'm concerned uh, very much with, with the ethnic ground level, which is how I talk about war. So I'm gonna talk about today is the experience uh, of, of combat, how it affects one while one is in it, but more importantly, uh, what happens afterwards. Um, I'm uh, working on issues of trying to end colonial rule in the Pacific, uh, I read, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's The Government of Poland. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but it's a brilliant book. Uh, the, the, the Poles asked Rousseau to write them a constitution that would in some way help them prevent Russia, Prussia, and Austria from partitioning them. Uh, and and Rousseau, said, Rousseau said, you you can't stop them. They're too powerful. All you can do is remain uh, true to being Polish, and you will eventually uh, prevail and uh, that sounded uh, not very practical at the time, but, but, it, but it paid off in the long run. And I mention this because I see this area that we're talking about right now uh, 
as a, an area where warfare is likely to continue for a long time. And so what I want to convey is uh, what I consider uh, one of the fundamental contradictions of fighting in a war or being in an area where war is being fought, being a non-combatant, but being uh, in, overwhelmingly impacted by the war. That is a contradiction that in order to fight effectively, uh, 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 I'll use the word soldier here. Uh, there are many different terms that I could use. A soldier, to, to be effective, has to block out a great deal of the danger. You, you just can't do what you need to do if you are conscious of that. And uh, I'm, I'm extremely aware when I look to back to my experiences in war, I can see myself, I can see my body language, and I can see that I was terrified, that I was unaware that I was terrified at the time. That was what allowed me to do the job. And, and I, and I want to stress that because what can happen then is that you come back thinking that nothing untoward happened to you, that you're okay. And that prepares you to go out the next day and do the same thing and come back and go out the next day and do the same thing. I think I mentioned this last week. It's a process that I call lamination of stress and trauma, thin layers day after day after day that build up into a thick brick, uh, a laminated trauma. Um, and one can have that and be quite unaware of it. That's, that's what I wanna emphasize that um, it, it is not at all uh, likely that the people who come back from combat uh, are aware of what happened to them for just this reason. Um, and that they can in fact take this ability to focus, to block out and ignore extraneous things and say that, that they have been successful, that they can continue to succeed and race on through life, carrying uh, this burden of trauma that they're unaware of. Um, the trauma can uh, be uh, acting out in ways that they're unaware of. Uh, for instance, when I came back uh, from Vietnam and started college, uh, I crashed and totaled out three cars in two years uh, while I was drinking. And it never occurred to me uh, that I had a drinking problem or that it was related to what I had just been through. Um, I almost got kicked out of graduate school uh, for a, a series of problems that were closely related to the war. And the only thing that saved my life was the fact that uh, Back when I was in graduate school, most of my teachers had fought in World War II and they recognized what I was dealing with and they, they saved me. So what can happen then, and this is what I'm talking about the long run, is that someone who has been uh, severely traumatized by the war and is, is unaware of it can go along uh, and... Uh, gradually find themselves, because they have been, uh, on, to all appearances, functional, having created uh, a, a life with uh, a, a job and a family, and then something happens when your emotional budget uh, is redirected away from repressing, holding in the war, because you're spending your uh, emotional energies dealing with uh, work and family, all kinds of responsibilities, and you no longer have the capacity to repress what happened during the war, and it begins to manifest itself. And if you are uh, someone who comes from a background like I did, a working class American who grew up with the notion that uh, I was uh, supposed to be a hero, uh, then uh, any weakness that I might feel uh, is, a, is a real threat to me. And uh, rather than confront it, grapple with it, uh, I do everything I can to deny it. Uh, and uh, I was very fortunate uh, that um, I had uh, some people who were capable of pointing out to me uh, how uh, far off the track I had gone. And were able to direct me to some treatment and, and most importantly, medication. Um, I'm, I'm very heavily medicated, uh, which allows me to continue to, to uh, be functional. I'm a husband and a father and a grandfather, and I continue to teach. And to be honest with you, 
I have no idea how I can do all of this, given what I carry around with me. Uh, if, if, I, if I wasn't medicated, uh, I would not be here right now. Uh, people often ask me how I can remain so calm, and that's my answer. I'm heavily uh, medicated. Uh, so I go back to this notion that the symptoms begin to manifest themselves. You are afraid to uh, allow yourself to show these things, and uh, you can very easily get yourself into a lot of trouble because of this denial. And uh, th that to me is uh, a very uh, characteristic long-term uh, outcome from having been in combat and having to the, to the outside eye succeeded in uh, getting through combat and being relatively healthy and whole is that there is this slow breakdown. Um, as a, a teacher, a university teacher here uh, in New York City, uh, I have a, a, a number of students who are veterans of the United States, uh, more recent wars, particularly Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, when I sit and talk with them, uh, I find this uh, pattern repeating itself that um, they are, see themselves as having been quite successful uh, and are hell bent on succeeding. They're totally focused on their studies. They don't wanna talk about the war. It, that's in the past, it doesn't bother them. And the more that they insist to me that they're fine, that nothing happened to them, the more I worry about them because I see this pattern of uh, hiding from oneself uh, the burden that one carries around. Um, there are uh, a great many criticisms in the United States today of uh, the concept of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and, and I'm somebody who has a, a rating of 70% disability for post-traumatic stress disorder, but I, I'm in denial about that in many ways because there is such a history in the United States of saying that people are just doing this, they're faking it, it's a fraud to get the money. And I picked that up. I live in a society where that's a common way of uh, referring to people's uh, manifestations of trauma is you're just doing this to get sympathy or to get payments. And that makes it more difficult so that it is doubly difficult to uh, get in touch with, to express, to reach out and get help uh, for these conditions. And so, uh, you know, I will just wind up by going back to this uh, notion uh, that uh, this area uh, of Eastern uh, Europe has uh, an incredibly long history. I, and I can't imagine uh, that uh, Doug's going to get his peace systems in place any, anytime in the near future. Um, and there is going to be long-term consequence of uh, these uh, invasions that are going on right now and that people need to be prepared to recognize that um, the uh, intense uh, fervor with which Ukrainian people are resisting right now, it looks heroic, but in the long run, that is going to have catastrophic results. Uh, even if Russia is rolled back that, that country is going to have vast numbers of people who are, are going to carry uh, an enormous amount of trauma with them. I'll stop right there. Um, thank you very much. That's a lot of food for, for thought of what happens um, after the war as well. Um, OK, so we will move to our next um, speaker. Uh, Professor Gintotas Mojekis, who has uh, kindly agreed to join us at the last minute. Um, he is a professor of philosophy at Vitotas Magnus University. And the title of his talk today is Between Maidan and Territorial Defense Forces, the Practice of Horizontal Self-Organization. So um, Gintotas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I was invited unexpectedly two hours ago, so sorry for so quick. Uh, thank you for Victor for such uh, challenges, you know, immediate. <clears throat> okay, but I'm uh, uh, working in this area uh, quite a long time. 
I'm interested in self-organization in the protests and wars. If you want into anarchy and autonomy in war, into elements of anarcho-syndicalism and the war. That is why I was interested in Kiev Maidan, you remember, 2013, 2014. Now in the, the territorial defense forces and in the, as well, actually theoretically in Nestor Makhno councils in Ukraine, uh, 1990, 1921, and the Barcelona anarchist councils during the Spanish war and Ro 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 Rojava, Rojava anarcho-syndicalist in Kurdistan and how all of them were uh, discussed between anarcho-leftist thinkers, how they were reflected uh, in uh, the books or articles devoted to anarcho-leftist uh, theories. I was, I participated in Maidan uh, field uh, research, if you would like, but actually I just was participant. I have a lot of friends uh, and interact with uh, the volunteers of the territorial defense uh, forces. I prefer territorial defense troops in Kiev. I am interested not only in acts uh, of war, not only in the cruelty of mercy, but in the social organization of everyday life of them. Food supply, sanitation, sleep distribution, arms care, communication with army and military, other military forces, defense forces fear, music, songs, talking, uh, culture of them. Between the researchers of similar topics, as you could just mention, Jack Snyder, Anarchy and in his, his Ethical Anarchy and Culture Insight from the Anthropology of War, or some of my conclusions coincide with the book of Sophie Ecolos, Jacob Dury and Ariel Pleny, Anthropology and Anarchism. When it comes to the question of today, uh, how to ensure peace in the time of war, is probably a question of how to ensure the self-reliance and safe neighborhood of the citizens in the large territories, for example, in the cities. Uh, in Ukraine, this is served by the egalitarian territorial defense forces which are directly origin from the Cossack spirit, Cossacks, Kazakh spirit from anarchists, uh, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, this tradition of Nestor Makhno and uh, from Ukraine Maidan and M Ukraine Maidan. Okay, there are many parallels and common experience between Sotnes, Sotne means hundreds or Latin centuria, centurions, Sotnes is the name of uh, the troops on the barricades in the Maidan period. And uh, current territorial defense uh, forces, territorial defense uh, uh, troops are organized uh, on the basis of experience of Sotnes. When I was in Maidan in Kiev in November and December 2013, I watched as barricades uh, and Sotnes in their horizontal self-organizational networks. In the square in the center of Kiev stood many snow and metal barricades and other fortifications up to the six meters high, including many tents and finally two scenes, the big and the small. Maidan volunteers slept in other busy public buildings in the near nearby post office and food was also being prepared in this building. Food was brought in, donated, bread, bacon, sausage. Borscht was boiled in the large boiler outside on the square between tents. The mean that everybody could eat, but it was some kind of claim. If you have possibility to eat, to eat somewhere outside, please don't eat in the Maidan. Why? Because that there are many of uh, food, but not for everybody. It, and if you have possibility to organize the food for yourself, please do it. 
and help for the other. This is the principle of self-organization. It, it means that if you could organize or to donate for yourself, do it, but do not take from the, uh, from the, uh, from the group because some, some of the people probably needs more than you. All you need always to think, do you need, exactly need this food or this supply? Or could you organize by yourself? This is, was uh, very important. Maidan volunteers, uh, uh -huh. uh, then uh, the main polit uh, political agitation at concerts took place on the big stage in the period of Maidan and lectures and mini concerts took place on the small stage and spontaneous stages. And I, uh, gave a lectures on the small stages. It was my big experience, you know, to read uh, philosophical and political philosophy lectures on the, uh, between barricades. It's very special experience, I would say. Uh, eventually, uh, many of uh, Sotnia, Sotniks of volunteers in the barricades became soldiers, later soldiers of the Ukrainian military battalions in 2014 war in Donbass. Recall, recall uh, then the army easy betrayed, uh, regular uh, Ukrainian army easy betrayed what happened in the Crimea or split into Ukrainian or Russian uh, parts in Donbass. It means that Ukrainian army really failed in 2014, and the only these Sotniks or, uh, could organize could organize volunteer battalions, and they went uh, uh, thousand kilometer outside uh, one thousand kilometer outside Kiev to Donbas in order to defend these uh, territories because there was occupied by. Uh, very different uh, Russian forces. I, I, I don't have time uh, to explain the differences, the varieties, peculiarities of the Russian forces. But in, in any way, in, in any way, this Sotnes, Sotnes transformed themselves into, uh, into volunteer military battalions, um, battalions, and they later were transformed into regular, regular uh, military forces of Ukraine. So we see this volunteers activism, you know, on the level of barricades and protests, transformation of them into, uh, into uh, uh, military volunteers. Uh, it's not reservists, it's uh, different. You could find, uh, today I checked uh, Wikipedia on the same topic and they found that they explained them as a reservist, it's, uh, it's, it's wrong, it's false. Uh, they are not, uh, many of them uh, are not reservists. I personally know, I know many of them. They are my friends. They never served in any military forces before. They were completely peaceful uh, people. Some of them biologists, some of them painters, some of them designers or teachers. They, are not, they were not related to the military forces. Uh, before the uh, military or war, uh, war events. On March 30, uh, one day ago, and then today, I spoke to my old friend, Alex, let's it be La Alex, from uh, the Maidan barricades and friend of uh, the volunteer battalions. And, with, and I talk with friends of volunteer battalions specifically with the Azov, Azov battalion. Azov is very famous. Uh, Putin always uh, mentioned this battalion as the most Nazi and blah, blah, blah. And uh, they would like to present him as the most uh, dangerous, I would say, uh, battalion. But uh, I know many of soldiers from them, this battalion that is for former designers, if you would like. Some of them <laughs> program is it's it's this is uh, it's not so simple. Many of them are Russians, not Ukrainians, you know, even or Russian speakers. So this is an absolutely lie about this uh, as of battalion. But in any way, this is interesting. And this friend from friends from territorial defense uh, troops, they told me 
how territorial defense forces works, but I prefer uh, how, how they work, you know, and how they are or, or organized. And they confer, confirmed me they, uh, this one uh, genealogy of them. They are completely related with the Cossacks' uh, self-organization, and then with this sotness, sotness which I mentioned before, uh, before, and uh, with this uh, Maidan experience. A friend of mine uh, uh, told me that his father yesterday he told me that his father, who was who is seventy-five years old, came to the police, uh, official police, uh, state police, to apply for permission to be uh, a member of uh, territorial defense troops. He was, uh, he was told that he was too old, 75 years, you know, and had no, and that these territory organizations no, had no vacancies for a long time, probably. Uh, the father then said that he have five arms, five rifles at home, rifles at home, and uh, began arguing uh, over who was stronger physically, he or the cop, you know. He said, okay, show me uh, how, how you are strong, and I will show how, how I am organized and strong. And he persuaded this uh, policeman that he could organize, uh, he could be a member of these troops, but they say, okay, look, because you have at home a lot of arms, you could organize, you could organize your own terri territorial defense troop. We could recommend some place for you and you could go and to invite your friends, you know, and you could organize with your arms, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, territorial uh, defense um, uh, troop. What is important here to, uh, to remember that uh, state doesn't donate, uh, no, these sotniks, no, these territorial defense troops. If you would like to organize the territorial defense troop, you could uh, manage everything. You could find arms for yourself, you know. You need to find donation and food for yourself and for the troop, you know. You need to find, organize sanitary for your own and communication for your own. That what, uh, 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 and what uh, the state uh, does in this uh, case, state could supply to, to propose you, if a state has possibility, some arms. For example, what is important here to remember that 25 of February, 25 February, uh, the war started 24 February. And 25 February, uh, President Zelensky, he edit uh, uh, the order, the edit uh, order that, uh, uh, all the people could uh, all the people could take could take any Kalashnikovs of arms from the military forces who would like to participate in Kiev or Kharkiv defense. It means that everybody, if you have Ukrainian citizenship and you would like to participate, you could go to some special places to show your document, you know, and to get for free some uh, arms, you know, uh, this, in this case, Automat Kalashnikov or some, someone else. Uh, actually, there, there, there were a lot of criminals or provocators who took uh, these arms as well. But uh, later, ter territorial defense troops, they cleaned uh, the city from these criminals, you know. They organized uh, neighborhood defense or neighborhood uh, uh, sa uh, safety safety but uh, for me it's more interesting not only this uh, military action of ter territorial defense troops but as well what how do they organize their own life and this is very interesting because for example if you if a uh, uh, state couldn't uh, give money for them or if state couldn't uh, organize or, or help with some arms they need to do for yourself for for themselves for example, yesterday I asked my friend Alex how he organized so good internet uh, internet uh, um, relationship, and he answered me that he bought 200 meters of uh, 
this uh, light cable. Uh, he bought this uh, cable, internet, good internet cable, uh, speed uh, cable, you know, and he, together with uh, his friends, organized in his office uh, uh, of territorial defense troop, uh, very nice internet. And he uh, uh, commented me that, you, you know, that I'm, I had a big experience from the from Cossacks, from uh, Berikats. And I know that uh, if you would uh, uh, like to survive and to organize everything in the best way, you need to do for yourself, you know? And he organized for his team a good internet uh, relationships. And the other troops, they don't have so good relationships because they didn't uh, bought uh, this ca cable, you know, for that. It, it means that everybody organized for themselves, but, what is important here then as well, uh, have a communication with uh, state police and state military forces, state military forces. O ordinary uh, uh, municipality, for example, Kiev municipality, uh, uh, give, uh, gives uh, one uh, officer from military forces and one officer from uh, police uh, forces to help to organize this territorial defense block block po block post in order that uh, they could uh, provide for example checking of documents checking of persons you know personalities or to resist uh, russian aggression or to stop diversions not saboteurs but diversions diversions and uh, this uh, stopping of diversions is uh, and spies and finding of spies is one of the obligation of this uh, neighborhood uh, defense, territorial neighborhood defense, as well as they organize uh, defense from any uh, criminals, from any cr criminals. Now it's zero criminality where these uh, territorial defense forces are. However, if there is no any military action, if there is no any military action, what they are doing in this time? They are learning, first of all. They organize lectures, as I uh, uh, tell you before. They organize very different lectures, from political philosophy to the, uh, for example, paramedicine, paramedicine, how to help uh, people, you know. Or uh, they learn some uh, military, uh, military science, how to use the, the one sort of weapons or the other sort of weapons. Then uh, they organize uh, exhibitions, if you would like, they organize some cultural life, as well as they help for the people who are in metro, for the uh, women, you know, children, many of them, uh, hundreds of thousands of them are in Kiev metro, and they try to organize uh, some food supply for them, you know, to organize some uh, safety, uh, safety, many, many of, uh, they are doing many of organizational work. In conclusion about this one, uh, part uh, what uh, uh, what I could uh, what is important here they all these territorial defense troops are equal in, and all the people in territorial uh, defense troop are as well equal no hierarchies here and so called leader of uh, sotnes sotnik or the leader of territorial defense uh, troop is just uh, uh, if you would like it's um, uh, situational leader or big man, if you would like, if he very good organizer from anthropology, something between situation, situationist leadership to the big man leadership, you know, that is not, they, it's based on the uh, neighborhood and social and cultural skills, but not on the ideology. It's not about ideological relationships, you know. And uh, this is very important. And from this point of view of egalitarian, horizontal egal, egalitarianism, they are in some, on some level with, in conflict with the state vertical of power, with the state of vertical of power. And they say that, uh, for example, uh, Zelensky, uh, President Zelensky needs, to, needs always communicate and negotiate with, with these territorial defense forces because if he said something against this territorial defense forces, they immediately organize between themselves some kind of referendum 
and they will say immediately, stop, we don't agree with you. And they have this force, uh, uh, have this force. They could do it, you know, because, uh, because this uh, uh, territorial, uh, horizontal self-organization and self-power, this multiplicity of them, they are very different. That uh, could be like, for example, barricade, some of Jewish barricade, some Georgian barricade, and territorial defense troops are, could be as well very Russian oriented or multilingual or from this region or more oriented to the cultural events than the, there are many of artists or some of them work as more proletarian, if you would like. They are very different from this, uh, this sense and they behave quite differently, and, but they communicate between each other, you know, and organize some kind of network of the horizontal network. And I found that it's very similar to the ideas of anarcho-syndicalism. And if you will check how anarcho-syndicalists describe the ideal society, they uh, understand, understand this uh, society as some kind of horizontal syndicalist uh, uh, networking with the permanent referendum on all important questions and discussion with a very deep uh, inclusion into political actions, this in inclusive democracy and participatory democracy as well. And in, a, but it, it is, and different little bit from anarcho-syndicalists. For example, Kropotkin, uh, the leader of a part of anarcho-syndicalism, he negated the possibility of the state. He said, uh, and uh, for example, uh, Nestor Machno late as well, he uh, denied uh, deny, uh, the need of uh, the state because they said that uh, we could organize for ourselves everything, that these anarcho-syndicalist groups could organize everything. Uh, contemporary uh, Maidanian and territorial defense troops, they have different experience than uh, anarcho-syndicalists. They pre propose uh, a completely different model. As uh, This is two, uh, if you would like, two type of state organization. One type is this horizontal multiplicity, horizontal multiplicity, uh, which is very similar to anarcho-syndicalism. And in parallel, there is the state with this very standard uh, state structure, you know, president, uh, diversity of power, this is a separation of powers, uh, you know, this uh, military forces, police, and so on. And they try these two blocks, one anarcho-syndicalist and the another state, statists, they would like to organize some kind of collaboration to find possibility to collaborate between each other. It's difficult to, uh, when we see this model works quite good. The model works in the period of crisis. In the period of crisis, we see that this model is, works very nice, you know, because the state needs uh, uh, citizens and citizens uh, uh, get uh, full freedom for self-organization uh, and citizens uh, don't trust uh, uh, the uh, vertical of power or the ordering. They uh, know that uh, something could happen only if they will organize it. Even they organize financing and defense uh, and defense and uh, uh, sharing of, uh, of arms, sharing of arms between uh, themselves. From the other side, from the other side, if we look at the real military, uh, or, or on the real uh, field uh, of war, warfare, we will see that these uh, territorial defense troops couldn't defend from the uh, tanks attack, you know, big tank, uh, or some from the uh, uh, from the uh, plane, military planes, you know. Uh, uh, it could be organized only by the state, you know, that uh, they, they need some, some level of collaboration. In the peaceful time, which is a different topic than, the, than I presented, uh, we see as well possibility for the, this uh, territorial commu com communities, territorial communities organization, they, they as well could organize their own life, their own life, but um, uh, their own life, in the, uh, in the, I would say, in the competition 
permanent competition with the state institutions, institutions of the state, institutions of the state. So I see here, uh, finally, my conclusion that these uh, models which comes from uh, Maidan and uh, from territorial defense uh, troops and territorial defense forces, they, uh, uh, so, uh, they, they uh, present the other anarcho-syndicalist model, uh, which uh, means not the exclusion, uh, 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 exclusion each other, I mean, anarcho-syndicalist and state, but collaboration, collaboration between state, uh, which is vertical of power and uh, horizontal uh, groups, uh, troops and groups uh, of uh, 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 self-defense and self-organization. And it helps to organize uh, social safety, uh, uh, security. It helps to organize social security, cultural security and cultural involvement in this uh, such, in, in such kind of, uh, of the crisis. And uh, many of countries started even to learn to study this one experience. And uh, I could uh, say that uh, Poland and Poles, uh, militaries and uh, activists, political activists, they learned a lot from this Ukrainian experience. And I would say uh, today in Lithuania, this one experience as well started to be very interesting, which is different from regular theories of paramilitary forces. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gendoti. That was very interesting to hear about that self-organization on the ground um, in Ukraine. Um, so I actually don't see our uh, fourth speaker, David Hanek, amongst participants yet. Hopefully he will uh, still join us and give his talk. Uh, but that at this point, then, let's um, open the floor to a discussion amongst our three uh, speakers. So if any of the speakers have any questions or comments, um, Douglas, I see your hand uh, going up. So, so please go first. Yes, th thank you for that talk. I have a, a, a question for you, Professor Mozaikis. Um, hope I'm saying your name somewhat correctly, <laughs> as the intention. Um, I'm just intrigued by your finding there about the horizontal organization. And I'd be curious to know if you have any speculations or hunches as to what sort of factors are behind that in terms of this particular cultural group or country culture organizing that way. I, I, and you know, I, 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 in my own mind, I'm, I'm playing with it, but I'm, I'm sure you're much more close to the, the data and the experience. So I, I'd just love to hear a bit more as to how you think that came about and how that fits that situation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Douglas. And uh, 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 first of all, this one's some sort of uh, development of society into two parts, into two blocks, uh, uh, depends uh, from uh, untrust, distrust, distrust of the citizens to the state. Because state is very corrupted for a long time, the Ukraine was uh, and is a very corrupted state that uh, which uh, where, uh, Many of politicians are related uh, with, with the uh, oligarchs, local oligarchs, and uh, many of people don't trust uh, such kind of, uh, of power. And they remember about uh, betrayals uh, from that many of Ukrainian presidents betrayed uh, uh, citizens in their, for example, that the citizens would like to sign agreement with EU and Yanukovych decided to reject it and to accept the proposal from Putin. And people started to openly express their, uh, that express their uh, distrust that uh, they, they don't trust uh, uh, this uh, government, uh, go governmental organizations, and would like to organize the different one, self-organization. But from the other side, very quick, they found very quickly that uh, that state, Ukraine, is so big that it's impossible uh, to organize all the life of the state on this uh, self-organizational level. 
that is completely impossible, no technically, no uh, from fi financing way and, and so on. And because they had a long history of Cossacks, which always uh, uh, lived in such kind of self-organizations from the one side. And that they have uh, as well that uh, experience from Austro-Hungarian Austro -Austro empire, because some of uh, Ukraine for a long time, it's Galicia, Galicia where is uh, uh, Lviv, uh, Ivano-Frankovsk, uh, for example, cities. This Galicia for a long time, for centuries, were the part of Austro-Hungarian uh, empire. And they experienced this uh, trust, big trust to the state and big trust uh, to the, uh, to the uh, order, you know. And from the other side in south, uh, southeast of Ukraine, this was mostly uh, Zaporozhye Sich. Sich means uh, some kind of community, of Cossacks community. And from the other side, they remember this long history of anarcho organizations like <coughs> Nestor Makhno. So this uh, synthesis between, synthesis between this Galician Ukraine and Cossacks Ukraine created this one two poles, uh, two poles uh, condition, you know, uh, that Cossacks don't trust uh, the state. And from the other side, some of Ukrainians are very state oriented, you know. They, for a long time, it was a big question, could this nation be together? Because as they are so different. Western Ukrainians are very different from Central Eastern Ukrainians, from the mentality, even from the civilizational point of view. But this kind of uh, many of crises, if you would like, this uh, many of tragedies, the, uh, uh, this uh, many of events uh, uh, created the situations that these two attentions, attitudes, these two attitudes started to collaborate between each other, state orientation, and anarcho orientation. But uh, both of them are very different from the Russian uh, Moscow or Moscow or Kremlin, uh, Kremlin character of power, where the ordering, ordering from the Tsar or some, someone else is the rule, is the rule for everybody. That is absolutely impossible for the Ukrainians, you know, such kind of, uh, such kind of, of, of orientation. And they are looking for a long time so what kind of self-organization they could find. And this, this is very interesting that all these Maidanians from Maidan, people of Maidan, you know, or this uh, territorial defense uh, troops and the other self-organizational groups, they uh, deny that this, that they deny an ideology of anarchism. They said, okay, we are pa only partly anarchists, not fully anarchists. We are partly, this, this uh, being of partly anarchists, this is as well very interesting because between them, there is uh, anar different anarcho parties, political parties. They are not popular between uh, Ukrainians because they don't like full, full anarchism. They just would like to get small, if you would like, or particular anarchism. Please, I interrupt discussion, sorry. Um, thank you. So if any of the speakers have any additional questions or, or comments, the floor is open. I would like to uh, ask Doug uh, a question that occurred to me uh, as he was laying out uh, this peace systems proposal. And I was thinking to myself that uh, one of the things that we've uh, become extremely conscious of with uh, the pandemic is that having data does not in any way uh, ensure that people are going to pay attention to it. And um, something that leapt out at me was that in one of the slides that you presented um, about uh, Jean Monnet, uh, I saw George Ball's name. Uh, George Ball was one of uh, a number of people involved uh, with uh, the United States prosecution of a war in Vietnam who had served uh, with a strategic bombing 
survey uh, in Germany after World War II, all of those people saw the same data. Uh, they all understood that strategic bombing was only rarely effective. Ball said, therefore, there is absolutely no point in uh, going ahead and bombing North Vietnam, which is what I did. That's why it's on my mind. Um, the others who saw the same data uh, proceeded, uh, even though they knew it would have no effect, to do it because it allowed them to be essentially vindictive. And I'm wondering whether you've thought through this problem of just because you have uh, exceptionally good data uh, that you can show to people, whether they'll pay any attention to it or not. Well, that's, that's the uh, $5 billion question, isn't it? How do you get people to attend to data or arguments, uh, whatever? Uh, I mean, just some sort of random thoughts. First of all, th thanks for asking the question. It's a very interesting question. I mean, I, I tend to see that this is a multifactorial argument or proposition where ideally you can appeal to people that relate to stories and narratives and can somehow you know, have a personal investment in this. So I think people are often moved to change their thinking or change their behavior uh, when there's a narrative that touches them. So telling stories. So in, in the slideshow, especially a longer version of the same, um, you saw there were some quotes in there from the individual uh, members of different peace systems and so forth in the film as well. So this is one approach that we try to use to, to make it human and, and to make it a, a story. And then the data itself will appeal to some people, uh, I, I hope. Um, you know, science is one of these things that is so useful, so necessary in the 21st century. We wouldn't be where we are without many scientific advancements. And yet there's the counter science movement as well. So playing on the positive, instead of just, and Genevieve and I've talked quite a bit about this, um, at least in the United States and perhaps more generally, peace is sometimes perceived as something that is just fluffy and airy and, and sure, a great idea, we, we all want peace, but then you know, to come into the realism of it, it's just not gonna be possible. So where I, where I think it's important to talk about science is this presents a solider argument, right? There is data, there's, there's, a, there's a theory, there's testing of hypotheses, there are findings that come out of this, um, which can appeal to some people, some decision makers, I would hope. So, so basically, at least there's a, a two-tracked um, intention here, how to convey the message. And since you mentioned Jean Monnet and, and George Ball, he, he was there on a cover of one of the books, he wrote the forward to one of the books, which was an interesting forward. Um, I, I'll heartily recommend to anybody who's concerned about questions of European integration and more broadly about how to create social change. Monet was a wizard at this and an absolute genius in many of the things he did. Uh, one thing he liked to do was to bring people cooperatively together. So I, I think about your organization, the horizontal organization, of the defense um, units. Monet was raised in a small cognac producing town and they existed in that town via cognac producing cooperatives as a, as a balance to the very large um, cognac companies. And this seems to have had a big effect on him as he grew up the son of a cognac producer and became a cognac salesman himself. And to make those interpersonal ties, expand the network um, and work together on solving problems. So he, he did exactly the same type of approach across many levels during the 40s, uh, after the war in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, um, speaking out over and over. So I mentioned the, the little steps approach. You know, don't try to solve war immediately, but take progressive steps along a path that you see with a vision towards that goal. And it will literally be two steps forward and one step back, but stay on the path. Another one of his, his wisdoms, I, I think, was, uh, and this again relates to the, the idea of equality or egalitarianism. He'd learned very well from what happened after World War I and Germany was published, uh, punished, sorry, um, for their role in instigating World War I. Um, so he absolutely maintained that Germany was to be an equal partner in the new Europe. And when he went over and he saw then German, German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer, Adenauer ostensibly broke down in tears 
when he understood that Monet was proposing a plan which would have Germany on an equal footing. And I think one of the reasons that the, the EU has been highly successful, both of bringing its main mandate of peace to Europe um, and also with other, a whole variety of other factors, not that everything the EU does is perfect. I don't mean to imply that, but it's been very successful at cooperative endeavors, series of integrative steps, and of course, bringing peace, um, is that it, it's set up on all sorts of equal footing amongst the members. Uh, so this, this got Genevieve and, and me talking a few months ago about how we really haven't paid enough attention to peace systems being set up on a, on a fundamental principle and action of equality. And we started reflecting then on the Haudenosaunee. Um, same thing there. It's not like there was gross inequalities. Sometimes it's misunderstood when we're talking about peace systems. People think that, oh, it could be a piece of domination where one group comes in and, and subjugates other groups. That's not at all what we have as a, as a model of a peace system. It's been implicit and we need to make that more explicit, I think. Um, again, turning to Switzerland, which you saw briefly in the film is, is one of the historical cases of a peace system. Those, those cantons, the Swiss cantons, that previously had engaged in a, a lot of wars over centuries with each other in different combinations of alliances and for different reasons, set up a new constitution, which they were all going to be part on, again, on, on equal footing. So it's a very interesting principle there. And, and part of that is you know, the, the basis for my asking the question, of you, Professor Mazakis, to try to understand the, this tension between hierarchy, domination, uh, ranking of peoples, and on the other hand, equality and, and values and, and norms and so forth. So we, we look provisionally at, at equality as a, as a peace value. We haven't had a chance to go systematically back to our, our data and, and look at this in, in a a numeric way or something like that, but uh, it, it's on the agenda for something we need to do probably next or very soon as we continue to understand peace systems. Did I, did I get to your enough uh, discussion of that, Glenn? I don't need to have missed something. Thanks for raising the question. So I think we can go to the audience questions. Um, we have at least two here. The first one um, is by Alan. Where are you again? Uh, Alan um, Oxhout? Yeah. It was just about the coding. I was curious how, you know. We had a question about that too. The coding, yeah. So I was very curious how how those values were, um, how Professor Fry got those different values on, you know, the, the twos, threes, fours, for yeah. How 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 will make the determination on each of those indices as how to code? I, I think by strange coincidence, we have two women named Ellen asking two different questions. Yes. So we'll we'll jump to your question, Ellen, since you're right there on the screen, Ellen Ellen Oxfield. Reading right, small. Okay, so so thank you for that question. First of all, the the first thing I can say is in in the article that came out in 2021, which is open access, so you can just easily go to it. And there's a maybe um, Victor will put a link in there. He had a, a link last week, I believe, to it easily. Or Gen BF, someone could put a link in there, or I could in a minute. So there's, there's a online supplemental material that talks about the methods and shows, in fact, our whole coding sheet. And um, basically, we followed the usual pattern for these cross-cultural studies of uh, devising a coding sheet for various variables um, and then coding ethnographic descriptions. So there, there's more there. Um, it's always a bit dissatisfying in the sense that it's subjective to a degree, right? You're making a, a value. Yeah, that's what I was like wondering grading. about. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're grading exams, right? Is this an A, an A minus, a D plus? You know, oh, is this a D? Why isn't it an F? You know what I mean? So there's that element with this type of research overall. So we had uh, multiple coders and we had weekly meetings to discuss issues that were coming up to one, make sure we're all on the same page and two, to deal with, with issues as best we could. 
Um, so anyway, if, if you want more results, there, there are more results about um, methods. They're in the article and in the supplemental material. And I don't know what else I could say to it. Uh, we, we tried to have relatively simple ordinal scales like that. Um, yeah, I noticed it was sort of one to four. So it seemed... Exactly. Yeah, for, for most of the variables. So if, if I'm not answering something that you think I could answer right now, please come back with a follow-up question for me. Thank you, that's helpful. And I'll I have a kind of follow-up for her. Did you use two or th how many quarters were there per, uh, per um, for doing this? One or two or three? And was there inner quarter reliability testing? Yes, we, we did not do inter coder reliability testing. So that's one of the weaknesses in our methodology, to be honest. Um, we had basically, I had the financial ability to hire graduate research assistants. And as I mentioned in passing before, this is very labor intensive work. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a team of us alternating more or less around six. They're the ones that did the coding or co authors on the paper. Um, so like I say, we, we divvied up the work. People became experts, for instance, on Switzerland um, or the Netherlands uh, or the upper Xingu, et cetera, and, and coded them out. And we discussed a lot and shared information. I guess the other point that, that um, Genevieve and I played was we would sit down with individual coders as part of their training and as the whole process went through and sort of try to monitor this in a, a soft level, I guess we could say, Victor, sort of a soft interreliability check as opposed to a statistical interreliability check. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm sorry, Ellen Estrada, you, you actually had the first one, but I saw Ellen Oxfield first. So, Ellen, are you there? I am. And Thank Damon, you you're much. next. Yes. And hello, Ellen, the other Ellen, too. So um, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, well, my question was around, uh, and thank you for exploring the EU as a modern example of uh, uh, steps toward peacemaking. But my question is, because of the presence of NATO, and in particular, the presence of the United States as an imperialist power in NATO, I, it would seem that that mitigates some of the... Um, advances that they've made. In other words, the EU could do this because they know that NATO's there, um, which is, um, of course, titled as a peacekeeping organization, but, um, and then also the complication of Russia and NATO. And as you um, said earlier, that all of a sudden things turned around very quickly in Europe um, with World War II. Um, uh, you know, it, it makes me a little anxious about all of that. So I guess the role of NATO um, for me kind of complicates this process. Yes, th thank you for that question. And, th and that's a really good question. And I'm not gonna be able to give you an answer to all elements of this, but I I'll, I'll just give you some thoughts uh, that I have about it. So first of all, when we're talking about peace systems and the EU in particular, again, it's a situation of clusters of neighboring societies that don't make war with each other. And the EU would be an example where war is still a possibility outside the borders of that peace system, as is the case for some other peace systems, right? So in, in a way, you could look at two different types, just to simplify it, two different types of peace systems, some that just don't make war, period, that's it, no war, and others that are clusters of neighboring societies that don't make war with each other. So that's that negative definition of a peace system. And I say negative because we're not talking about a positive peace element yet. Yeah, that's to come soon. Um, for peace systems. So next point here to, to keep in mind is that um, NATO and, and the EU are not identical, perfectly overlapping units at all. Um, so some members of the EU are members of NATO and, and others are not. Um, granted, there is a lot of overlap. Um, another thought about this is you, you're raising the question of imperialism. Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably the first person to see the United States as an empire uh, over recent decades. And, but I, I have a slightly different take on this through my understanding of the history, having lived through the history, and that is the Cold War element 
where NATO was had its oppositional unit, the Warsaw Pact, which did emerge after World War II. And the Warsaw, Warsaw Pact, of course, developed as the Soviet Union, did not give up land which they had liberated during World War II, um, their control over East Germany, uh, Poland, and then sent tanks literally right into Hungary and the former Czechoslovakia and so forth. And of course, we have the nuclear element where tactical nuclear war was discussed as a real possibility on the continent of Europe, not due to a forming peace system problem, but due in, instead to these two superpowers. So uh, maybe I'm just quibbling over terms, whether it's imperial or whether it's Cold War, two superpowers facing off with other countries as their pawns. Um, I sort of see it more towards the latter in terms of historical development. And, and yes, uh, here's an, a yes answer to that question. When you had a situation like that going on, NATO, Warsaw Pact, Cold War, arms race, this was, in, in, in fact, uh, many Im impediments to peace around the world beyond just Europe and, and so forth. So I agree with you, this made it more complicated. Now, what, what is interesting as we flash forward now into the present, um, NATO was sort of on the, you know, it was under discussion, do we really need this thing anymore? Should we really sort of disband it now until a few months ago, right? So history and world events are very interesting. Um, as we think about the Ukraine situation, and I know that's something that we've been given the charge to think about and, and talk about, I, I really regret you can't do, you know, <laughs> you can wish it had gone a different way. But I, I must think that if Ukraine had entered the EU some while ago, years or decades back, that we would not have seen it invaded. And that just would have preempted that situation. Uh, if it had been part of the European peace system. Uh, what the Haudenosaunee people, they, they had fabulous symbolism. What, what they portrayed as an ideal was that peace would be ever expanding. And in fact, they brought in a sixth group, the Tuscarora, which were based further south here in North Carolina, where I'm speaking from, uh, and environs. And they brought them as, as a sixth unit expanding their peace system. And when Europeans arrived, Europeans couldn't conceptualize this at the time, right? But the, the Haudenosaunee wanted to expand the peace system to include the Europeans. And in fact, with their symbolism of a great tree of peace, a great white pine of peace, the symbols are that the branches provide protection. And if you go down to the roots of the tree, there are four roots. It's always portrayed this way, representing north, south, east, and west. And the roots are supposed to expand ever outward to include others within the system. So you sort of see where I'm going there in terms of expanding outward to include other countries. This, this is one model as to how we could get to a more peaceful world generally, is have regional or smaller level peace systems literally be expanding in different directions. Now, I imagine right away someone's going to think, ah, but then are you going to get wars amongst the peace systems? Yeah, that would be a possibility for a while. I'll add one more comment here, and I, you know, th these are things to talk about and not to argue about, I think. But um, what we found then was that the non-warring norms were really so important in this. And I think that's one path to peace that, that therefore, based on our results and, and based on uh, a, a step forward, one of those steps that Monet talks about, is to start shifting our, our norms where peace is prevalent and war is no longer really acceptable. And I know it sounds a bit light and flaky and fluffy, right? But if you think about, we're all anthropologists, or most of us are. If you think about values as the principles that guide our lives and norms as being, roughly speaking, the rules of, of social conduct that you're supposed to follow, right? But these, we know, as anthropologists, have huge effects on how people behave. And, of course, there's going to be violators of these things, so you need to deal with that socially. We've managed to create societies over millennia of people more or less following the rules, more or less uh, getting along with each other within the social group. So one, one thing that I like to say about peace systems is, in a way, it's, it's raising the level of different institutions. The Iroquois had village councils, and the men and women of these councils helped people deal with disputes within the village. And also there were tribal councils where you got it. 
but problems within the tribe were kicked up to a tribal level and the chiefs uh, where the women had a, a big influence on who was going to be a chief and whether a chief could be impeached. Um, so it was not just a male dominated situation either, which is interesting. But then problems amongst different villages and subunits could be dealt with at the tribal level. So when they formed their, their union of peace, uh, guess what? There was the intertribal council. And it was not having to reinvent a whole new social mechanism for discussion consensus, problem solving. Notice I'm emphasizing these are nonviolent ways to do it, but they already had the model. And many of our Western countries have the, the same sort of situation with our courts. Now we have the municipal court, we have the district court, we have the federal you know, Supreme Court. We also have the International Court of Justice. We have the World Court, which is not truly a court at this point, unfortunately. It's more of an arbitration court. But you see what I'm going, we don't, have to totally invent everything from scratch, but we could make steps in moving them up the level. So I say with a little tongue in cheek, we need to up the level, right? Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you for the, the good questions. Thank you. Next, uh, Damon. Well, uh, first, I want to um, thank you, Professor uh, Peterson, for your um, really, I think, wonderful mixing of the phenomenological experiential aspect of your past and the conceptual framing that you give it. I think the combination of the two is really very powerful. And I also want to um, thank you for your challenge, I think, to Doug and to the rest of us, which is how do we, if I could just reframe what you said slightly and why I'm doing so, I think will become clear from my question. As the way I interpreted your question is that what do we do about the violent past being alive in the present? You know, that's a big challenge for all of us. And um, I want to reframe it slightly because you, I think you're pushing uh, on the basis certainly of your own experience, but also the experience of many other people, this idea of a trauma-centered paradigm. And I want to challenge that a little bit. And I want to get your reaction um, to my challenge. First, how you feel about it, having gone through the experiences that, that you've gone, but also in a more analytical and, and scholarly uh, perspective, not just a personal one. So the first thing I want to bring up is that uh, for ordinary Iranians, according to my uh, PhD advisor, Bill Beeman, the, the invasion and conquest of Iran by Alexander the Great seems like it happened yesterday, you know, for many Iranians. And, uh, you know, I suppose you could make an argument and say, well, that's because of it was a traumatic experience at the time. It's been culturally encoded as such. And therefore, you know, you can kind of put that within a within a trauma paradigm too. It's obviously not the same experience that you had because it's you know it's thousands of years ago. But there's still, you know, you could kind of put it in a trauma paradigm. But honestly, I think that's a bit of a stretch for me. I mean, you can do that. There is some validity to it. But I think another way of looking at it is to say that the violent past seems like it was like it was yesterday because it's so meaningful to people and it's so important. Um. And I think what we're dealing with here is the sense that the violent past is alive as an, and as in front of people. And certainly, you know, trauma has something to do with that. Absolutely. Especially for some people. But I don't think that's a universal experience. And I did my fieldwork among survivors of the Tajik Civil War. And that included people who were non-combatants and folks who were also combatants. And... Um, I found it fascinating to compare my approach to doing the research with other scholars who have done similar kinds of research and, you know, we'd kind of compare notes and uh, things like uh, intrusive thoughts from the war, you know, you just, you're, you're walking down your, your local street and you find somebody who is a relative of a person who was murdered during the war. Um, how do you classify that data of, of intrusive thoughts? Is that an indication of trauma for, for some people? Well, that certainly is. You know, that's an indication that the person is traumatized. And I don't classify it that way necessarily. I think it can be a healthy thing to have those kinds of thoughts. So, um, you know, these are, these are big questions, and they obviously have very significant societal ramifications, as we've seen in the way that the history of trauma has evolved over the last century and 
decade or two, you know, there's been incredible changes that you yourself have seen. So I just, as I say, I just want to get your reaction to that on a personal level and also a, a, on a more scholarly scholarly level. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for that question. Um, what uh, first popped into my head as you were talking about people uh, in Iran uh, having a sense that Alexander's uh, invasion w was still with them uh, was a, a colleague of mine um, who, uh, whose family left Iraq for Israel. And she was describing the scene at the border and how terrifying it was. And I asked her how old she was when this happened. And she said, oh, this was long before I was born. But there was no way that I could tell from the way that she was speaking of it that she hadn't been present. And, and I always think of that as an example of the degree to which it, it can be difficult to know uh, whether somebody is reporting on something they heard or something they experienced. I think uh, most of us have a tendency, a capacity to mix those together. But, but I, what I wanted to go to was the, the question um, about uh, intrusive thoughts and, and how we interpret them, how we experience them. And um, it's very clear to me, it's one of the reasons I'm most interested in this, it's one of the reasons I wrote my book, clear to me that for 20 years after I came back from fighting in Vietnam, I was utterly convinced that nothing had happened to me, nothing untoward. I had no problems. Looking back at it, I can see all of these things that were manifesting themselves, but I was unaware of them. And it was only when my daughter was born uh, and I had to reorganize my emotional budget, as it were, that uh, these things started coming back. Um, so I'm, I'm very conscious that um, in, intrusive thoughts uh, are, uh, I, I don't wanna say random, but they're contingent. It, it, it really depends on a, on a lot of factors about whether one has them and how one is affected by them. But it, it's, I, I, as you spoke, my mind went to uh, Daniel Kahneman's work on thinking fast and slow and the, the old brain and the new brain and the old brain being the, the, the warning system and the new brain being the, the, the responding system. And if, if we did not experience traumatic things as traumatic, we would not survive. That, that's part of the evolutionary dynamic. We, we have to have this. Um, and for me, the question is, um, why is it that uh, it, we're so in, uh, invested in denying this so often? Uh, it seems to me that that's how you get young people to fight. I mean, that's, that's another element of, of, of my book is... Uh, I was 17 when I enlisted in the military. I was 19 when I fought in Vietnam. I didn't know anything. Uh, I was far too young to understand what was happening to me. And that is why uh, big industrialized countries uh, seem to send young people to war is before they can conceptualize what they're doing. But in Micronesia, um, where some of the greatest battles of World War II were fought in those islands. And to them, war means those battles that uh, roared through their islands. When people out there learned that I had been in the war, they thought that I had been in World War II and they were a little bit puzzled. And they asked me and, uh, how old I was and gradually they figured out um, you know, that it was a different war, but that I had been 19 uh, when I fought. And I will never forget, and this happened repeatedly, <laughs> looks of incredulity on faces of people who would say, 19 years old, you are a baby. What kind of people would send their babies to war? Because in, in their traditions, wars were fought by fully mature men in their 40s. The same people who made wars went to war. And as a consequence, they didn't go to war very often, right? It's much easier to go to war as we're seeing with the Russians throwing these conscripted soldiers in. If you just have uh, large numbers of bodies that you can throw in there, uh, it's, it's, it's much 
easier to do it. So um, young people uh, have more difficulty, uh, I think, processing those old brain warnings. So I'll stop there. We have Christina Garalita. I think you have a question. Yes, uh, thanks to all the speakers for, for this excellent discussion. Uh, my question would be to Professor Majekis. Um, so the, the prevalent discourse uh, now in media particularly is how the war united uh, Ukrainian society. Uh, did you happen to observe uh, uh, back then during Euromaidan um, and also now during wartime, uh, any frictions or tensions uh, among different groups of Ukrainians uh, at the grassroots mobilization level? And uh, if yes, uh, what are these divisive issues? Thank yes, I, I, I have seen uh, endless of uh, frictions and tensions, if you would like, between uh, groups. And see, these conflicts are very interesting because, because for example, uh, if we are talking about Euromaidan, uh, there were a lot of uh, some uh, followers of uh, uh, Timoshenko that uh, it was uh, some groups of ultra rightists and populists they hated each other between them there were some anarchists or independent international groups related to jewish for example communities and there was endless frictions and tensions between them and still exist between these territorial defense uh, troops uh, they it sometimes even organize some uh, you know, conflicts between each other, but without using of weapons, uh, without uh, shuttings. It means uh, that uh, there is some kind of uh, demand to prove uh, your accusation, that one uh, group accused the other in some uh, way, and uh, the other uh, troop demands uh, the proofs, you know, you should present the proofs for the group, you know, that you are doing this one or this one. And they met, uh, they, they, they some, sometimes they meet each other uh, and uh, try to explain uh, very hot, you know, the demands to each other, you know, uh, very different. And uh, the same attitude is about uh, government. Uh, they always on the critique on if somebody, for example, in Ukraine of between officials said some lie, they immediately uh, tens of the other territorial groups or this uh, uh, horizontal organizations immediately will accuse he in the lie. You know, it's very difficult to work with propaganda in such, uh, um, uh, such obstacles, you know. But uh, this is what is important here that they uh, have some possibility to find limits of conflicts. The limits of conflicts. It's not about unity. As I said, we are not what does mean this unification of this nation? This unification means some uh, limitation of conflicts on the some uh, point of you would like, on some question. They decided not to develop some conflicts between each other. Don't discuss what, what for example, the conflicts are between them. Some of them are uh, uh, like in Lithuania, uh, LGBTQ supporters. Some of them hate LGBTQ. But now today they decided ne not discuss on this topic during the war. You stop this uh, question, you know, we will not ask this question, we will not develop. Oh, we're all right, we're all equal, you know, on, on this point. Later, after that, uh, our imagined victory, we will uh, start uh, this discussion, uh, discussion again. Or, for example, about uh, pensions, the level of pension. The state pay some pensions. They, they could endless discuss. These groups could endless demand have endless demands for the state. But now they decided that the state is uh, too busy, you know, to organize everything uh, related to the war. And so they will uh, would like to help each other on the com community level, you know, to organize some community. We help, uh, for example, there are many of volunteers who prepare soup for 
disabled people, you know, every day, or they care, they organize some care, and these territorial groups are very related, as I mentioned, with this, uh, with this uh, volunteers, because they don't, uh, they are not looking for the help of the state. So they are united from the one state, uh, from the one point about the war, who is the, uh, uh, who is the enemy of us, you know, and the others are, are different, you know, uh, uh, on, on the other questions, they could be, uh, could be completely, uh, completely, uh, completely different. This is, uh, but, in, but in any, any, anyway, there are many of problems. So you could see here uh, a lot of very strange, strange things. Some you could food, uh, you could get food for free, for example, on the streets. And from the other side, you could uh, buy very similar but better quality food with uh, with the big prices. You know this. Uh, There's a multi-level society. They are very different. Uh, there are many uh, levels of, 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 of this society, but they, uh, they would like to regulate uh, and in future, in future, they actually will have endless of civil conflicts after war, endless of civil wars on many of questions, but now they stop this conflict. If this unification means stopping of, of conflict. It's not that a totalitarian unification, it's not the um, uh, it's not the obeying, it, they are not obeying uh, to some kind of law, but uh, they agree, agree in this uh, time just uh, to stop, uh, uh, temporarily stop the conflicts, you know, which they will uh, produce uh, immediately after the end of war. Okay, I think we have, um, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have one more question and we're at seven o'clock. So if somebody asks a question right now, we can probably fit it in. But if Justine, you, you have probably the last question. Justine? McCain? I'm here, I'm here. Okay. I just unmuted myself. Yes. Um, I'm gonna put my thing open too. Um, I was asking uh, Glenn, what is an anthropologist he understood about why your trauma didn't really occur to you till your daughter was born? Well, I, I want to make it clear that I, I was unaware of what was happening in uh, the, the, the time that my daughter was born and the following years. It was only as I wrote this book and did a chronology that it became quite clear to me uh. what happened. Um, it was the situation of uh, me having this enormous capacity to uh, repress what had happened was one factor in it. But the second factor, and this was pointed out to me by a psychologist years later, is what is called self-medication. Uh, and I mentioned that I crashed and destroyed three cars in two years after I came back. I drank myself to sleep every night from the time I came back from Vietnam until my daughter was about three or four. Um, and it, it was when my daughter was born, there, there, there were a number of problems uh, with her delivery. It was an emergency C-section and my wife uh, was in very bad shape. And I was the one who did all the late night feedings. And so I sat every night with this infant looking at me as I was feeding her. And it turns out there's quite a bit of research on this, that, that my brain uh, system, my, my neurons were uh, very much reorganized uh, as a result of that interaction with the infant. And I can see that it was, it was within a year or two after she was born, that the war began uh, intruding on me. That's when the intrusive thoughts, I was starting to have flashbacks. And uh, I, I went to the Veterans Administration to get help with it. Um, that's uh, when I began to understand that I had been self-medicating uh, and, and that I uh, was in fact uh, an alcoholic and, and had to quit drinking and joined Alcoholics Anonymous and then irony of ironies, it was when I stopped self-medicating that the war came back 
full force. I no longer had the capacity to repress it, to bury it, to, to put the, a layer of gauze between me and it. And I've been haunted by it ever since then. So it's, it's quite clear to me when I look at that chronology that um, there was some uh, significant reorganization of my brain. Uh, I, it, I'd like to speak of it in terms of my emotional budget, but I'm not sure that's entirely accurate. But uh, that, that reorganization made me conscious uh, of the uh, impact that alcohol was having, which was in many ways very helpful. I mean, I, I'll, I'll just finish this by explaining um, that uh, I was somebody who was profoundly involved in my profession. Uh, I learned how to network by drinking and hanging out with older professionals. I was incredibly successful. And then I quit drinking. I have not been to a meeting of the American Anthropological Association in the 30 years since I quit drinking. I don't do almost anything in my profession anymore. I can't bear it. And, I, and I'm very conscious of withdrawing. There are very few anthropologists uh, outside of those who work in the Pacific who know me anymore because uh, I, I, I limp along, uh, no longer able to uh, do the things that uh, are expected of professionals. Uh, and Glenn, that's, that's I wanted to just I interrupt for a second. I guess I was beaten as I hear you. Um, it's an interesting thing that that um, transition, if you will, for you, traumatic, etc., happened at a moment of your of tr transmission of culture to your daughter. In other words, you're transmitting at that moment the ability for her to trust, which is the basis on which children will receive whatever cultural rules and so forth in socialization. So it's just an interesting thing that, that um, at that moment that occurred. Yes, it is. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, anyone else? Um, okay, so that's about it. I do wanna make one quick comment. I hope it doesn't last longer than quick, but right now it's already lasting longer than that. Um, but the comment I want to make, I think it's fortuitous that the three of you are here uh, because the, the three of you, uh, Douglas Fry and oh, Genevieve is there too. And, uh, and um, uh, and Professor Majekas, you two seem to have a lot in common, uh, I think, and particularly in terms of uh, the idea of uh, egalitarianism as a value uh, for the creation of peace and also the creation of collective groups that, uh, that, that uh, uh, work together to form these self-organizing uh, groups. Uh, if you're about self-organizing, there's a wonderful older book, 1999 or maybe 2001, by Chris Bohm that talks about how how hierarchy gets developed and how uh, tribal society or, or not tribal foraging societies in particular uh, resist um, hierarchy at all costs and they form ways. And I'm curious to know whether those ways by which they resist hierarchy are similar to the ways that uh, the self-organizing groups uh, that Professor Majekis is talking about do, if, if there's a similarity there, because they're also stateless and reject state kind of um, structures. And then I think the last thing I wanted to say was between Glenn and, again, uh, Gintautas Majekis, uh, that both of you are working with traumatized groups but very different. One is soldiers and one is civilians. Uh, and in the civilian one world, they're capable of organizing collectively. And in Glenn's world, I have a feeling that that is a different kind of trauma that hinders uh, the collective. So it would be interesting if the three of you got together a bit more than just today. Uh, you could work out things. There's all these dialectics there. Um, Christina Yonatita, do you want to close? To, you started it, do you want to close it? 
Um, I don't think I have much to add apart from uh, thank you very much to all the participants. I found the, both the talks and the discussion really interesting. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you to all of the audience members as well. Thank you. Uh, have a good evening, everyone. And this is